Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 And hello to everybody who is streaming this live. This is our first time to do a live stream, so I'm very excited that you are joining us for this experimental and hopefully very successful event. My name is Bahia Simons Lane. I am the executive director of US Jet AA, the US Jet Program Alumni Association. We're a 501c3 nonprofit umbrella organization that serves jet alumni um, across the United States. And if you are not a member, I hope that you will go to our website, usjetaa.org, and become a member today. Um, this is part of a series uh, or a a partnership that we have with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Um, previously, this um, partnership has focused on providing small grants to jet alumni chapters across the United States um, so that they can do events in their local communities that uh, focus on furthering U.S. Japan relations. But we wanted to do more events that can reach more alumni, and so we decided to try a live stream event where both the people in this room here in Washington, D.C. can join, as well as everyone who can log in online. And we are recording this webinar tonight, so uh, it will be posted for people who couldn't attend. I, before I um, step down and turn it over to Joy for a few remarks, I would also like to say thank you to FIU in D.C. Florida International University has a space here in Washington, D.C and they very generously provided us with the space and the perfect technology to do an event like this. I am also very happy to bring my jet life and my FIU life together. I earned my master's in international ed from FIU in 2014. I'm currently finishing my PhD there. So it's great that I can bring those two things together. Um, thank you all for coming. And now I'm going to welcome Joy Champu up to say a few words. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone here in Washington, D.C. for coming out today. Uh, for those of you who are participating online, um, you may not know, but we had a, a lot of snow, or we were told that there was going to be a lot of snow tonight, but and thankfully, we do have a really big full house here in, um, at the FIU in D.C., so we're really excited for a very dynamic discussion later on today. But for me, um, so I'm Joy Shampaloo. I am a program officer at Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. So. For those who aren't aware of us, uh, we are an independent American nonpartisan nonprofit organization located in Washington, D.C., and our entire organization is dedicated to strengthening U.S. Japan relations. So we do that through uh, many different programs, we do it through research and analysis, and we do it through outreach series, such as um, our partnership with the Jet Alumni Associations across the U.S., and our intention is to really engage the American people on the importance of why U.S. Japan relations is important to the United States um, as well. And so essentially, several years ago, Sasco USA, we realized that if we really want to be an organization dedicated to strengthening the Ocean Power relations, we do need to engage um, the jet alumni community across the United States, since all of you do represent 30,000 Americans who basically lived in Japan, worked in Japan. I should know I'm also a jet alum as well, so I really do understand the power and influence that Jello and I can have. And so tonight is really about all of you and to kind of engage you on an issue that you also indicated for an online poll a couple weeks ago that you were interested in learning more about recent trends and people to people ties and also any recent um, educational initiatives between the US and Japan. And so thank you so much for coming. Um, I am supposed to also now turn this over to Eric, who is, um, of our host here at FIU. Thank you, Joy. And uh, welcome everyone to FIU in Washington, D.C. For those of you who don't know much about FIU other than that sort of thinking about your master's degree, I have a brief introduction for you. <laughs> uh, FIU, if you're not familiar, is, has 50, 57,000 students ranking at the fourth largest university in the U.S. That's quantity, so what about quality? Of these state universities in Florida, based on metrics including affordability and graduation rates, FIU was the second highest performing uh, university in the state university system last year. 
We also have 18 programs among the top 100 lists of U.S. News and World Report, including our business, nursing, public affairs, and social work programs. This is important because we're serving our very unique population very well, where uh, around half of our students are either uh, Pell Grant recipient students or first of their family of one college first generation students. I'm particularly happy to be hosting an international education event here tonight. I've been here at FIU in Washington, D.C. for about two months now, but for the past eight years, I was working in our Office of Global Learning Initiatives with the GIA. And this represents uh, FIU's true commitment to global education, where it's normal for FIU, uh, it's normal for universities to have study abroad programs, international exchange programs. So what FIU did was make sure that every single student that graduated to a bachelor's degree from FIU takes courses in their general education and their major that has global perspectives. So we have over 200 courses at FIU from nursing to hospitality to business to my introduction to microbiology as a global learning course where those international intercultural perspectives are built in. And no student gets a bachelor's without taking at least two of those. And that's just the beginning of that initiative. There's much more to it. Uh, so we're happy to be doing this. Here in Washington, D.C., uh, we support the research priorities of our faculty members in areas including Latin America, postal infrastructure, cybersecurity, and, and STEM education. And on the student side of things, which uh, I am uh, leading along with my team here, we act as a pipeline from Miami to D.C. Our talent lab program, which is open to every single uh, student interning in D.C., uh, this semester we have 19 students interning in D.C. this spring. Uh, uh, experience a robust professional and cultural development program. And in this very room tomorrow, we'll be having uh, our orientation, our first intersection with all of our 19 interns uh, here this semester, one of whom is Madeline and joining us here uh, tonight. Uh, and so on this spot, I'm glad to have you here. And anything you'd like to discuss about FIU, we have materials in the kitchen I can discuss with you afterwards. And if you need interns from Miami or want to work with our interns, I'm here to help. So, thank you for hosting your event here today. Okay, I would like to very briefly introduce our two speakers for the night. We have Dr. Sheila Smith. She's a senior fellow for Japan Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Her current research focuses on how geostrategic change in Asia is shaping Japan's strategic choices. Um, Dr. Smith is also the Vice Chair of the U.S. Advisors to the U.S.-Japan Conference on Cultural Educational Exchange, COLCON, a binational advisory panel of government officials and private sector members. She also serves on the Advisory Committee for the U.S.-Japan Network for the Future program of the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation. She teaches as an adjunct professor at the Asian Studies Department of Georgetown University and serves on the board of its Journal of Asian Affairs. We also have here Mr. Jim Gannon. Um, he works at the Japan Center for International Exchange in New York City. And thank you for making the trip down to Washington, D.C. for this. Um, at JCIE, Mr. Gannon oversees a wide range of programs designed to strengthen the underpinnings of U.S.-Japan relations and encourage deeper international cooperation in responding to regional and global challenges. Jim is also a JET alumni and he serves as vice chair of the USJA Board of Directors. So we're very happy to have both of you here today. Um, Jim will speak briefly, and then, and then Sheila will speak for a little bit longer, and then they will have a dialogue on people-to-people -people exchanges and uh, educational initiatives. Um, during this event, uh, for people in the room, um, if there are opportunities to ask, get to ask questions, uh, Sheila will definitely let you know. And for those of you online, feel free to type your questions in the chat box at any time or use the Q&A feature within the Zoom webinar platform. All right, now without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Gannon. Thank you very much. Sorry, is the microphone? Push okay. your button. I didn't push my button. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to get a little closer to you. Maybe speak okay. into the microphone. That's better this way. <laughs> anyway, it's, a, it's an absolute honor to be up here. Um, I want to thank Sasakali USA, FIU, USJAA. Um, I'm, I'm glad all you fought through the blizzard of 2019. 
<laughs> um, and frankly, I'm just flattered to be sitting next to Sheila Smith. And I know some of you are in the U.S. Japan field. She's a key figure here, um, one of the smartest people working on U.S. Japan policy. But what's even more important is one of the kindest people in um, So today, I think we're supposed to talk about people, people exchange, and educational initiatives. And, and frankly, I don't, I'm not really an expert on education. so. There's not too much I can say that, that you don't know. Um, so I'll focus on people to people exchange. And part of it is as a general alumni, I, um, like the rest of you, I'm a product of it. I, in 1992, I went to Ekine. I never um, had a chance. I never thought about Japan. I couldn't have dined about a map almost. And I fell in love and it changed my life. Um, and then now, every day, as, as Mahia said, I run at JCA USA, JC. U.S. Um, arm of the Japan Center for International Exchange. So every day I'm focusing on people to people that exchange too. Um, so this really, I mean, it strikes right here in my heart. Um, but when Bahia asked me to do this, I started to think, well, really, how do I describe people to people exchange? Um, and I looked online on Google, and there's really no good definition. There's no good analysis. I mean, I can kind of know what it is. A request for you to speak louder. So let's thank see. you. Um, let's do this. Yeah. Okay. Is this working? Yes. Good. Um, so basically, I was looking for a definition of people. People exchange. It's really, I don't, I don't see anything sufficient out there. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit of what what I see as people to people exchange and what isn't people to people exchange. Then. A few thoughts uh, on the background, and then I think I'm going to continue to ramble into a little bit what the impact of people to people exchanges to. Um, but first, for when you talking about the definition, what what can what can people exchange consists of? When you look at a U.S. Japan relations or any relation between nations, I, mean, I think I can come up with at least ten different types of exchanges or interactions between the societies. You know, first, you know, you always think of diplomatic exchanges, and that could be the White House and the Prime Minister's Office, State Department, and Foreign Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and so on. Second, that would be commercial business exchanges, and these are all part of the bilateral relationship here. Third, I would think more professional exchanges. You know, what comes to mind for me is you might have a conference, scientists in a certain area get together, but these it's actually a quite vibrant exchange, series of exchanges between the U.S. Um, it's things like the American Library Association works with the Japanese Library Association. It's even things like um, the Mansfield Fellows, the Mansfield Foundation was brought up earlier. But this is a great program that places U.S. federal employees in their counterpart agencies in Japan for one year, two years, and builds a prize. So these professional exchanges are very important. Um, Fourth, and this is one that's very close to me, this is one that my organization does a lot of, the legislative exchange. And this isn't when legislators visit each other's country in a sense officially representing their country, but in a sense as fellow parliamentarians, they start to speak to each other. Um, and this helps strengthen the ties or at least build mutual understanding between the countries. And I think in a typical year, you probably have 50 to 100 Japanese diet members who visit the United States usually in Washington, many of them during Golden Week. Um, and then you probably have 10 to 20, 25 American professional members who visit Japan. And then the discussions that they have are very important. You don't hear about them often, but it does affect the relationship a great deal. Fifth, I would think of intellectual exchange. And this could be academics or it could be think tank experts getting together um, from both sides and comparing notes, what should we do with these people in Korea, what should we do in Ebola? You know, so common issues, common policy issues there generally. Six student exchange, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that. I think you know what that is. Seventh, um, grassroots exchange. And this is another big basket here. Um, but these are really exchanges that are community-based. Um, and I think the one that we come to mind initially, you know, first of all, for me, it's sister city exchanges. Um, my colleagues at JCA did a survey a couple of years ago looking at how many U.S. Japan sister city exchanges were, and we're surprised to count that 448 currently ongoing, and probably a lot of them are 
this. So there's a lot going on. You get out to Kentucky where my in-laws live, you get to Georgia and Alabama. There's a heck of a lot more going on than you realize. Um, I think I'll go up to number eight, and I see arts exchanges, cultural exchanges, whether it's dance troops coming back and forth. Um, number nine, tourism, in a sense, you know, and that's a bit more superficial. And then 10, um, sort of, I think, a family ties. This is something I think many of you in the room, and for me, you might have some of our family or Japanese, some are American, and that ties, you know, that all of these come together and are kind of form linkages that undergird um, the bilateral relationship between the U.S. and Japan. Now, I don't think you can call all these people people exchange. I think if you, you know, the ones after, not diplomatic, not necessarily commercial, but the ones in the middle of this list that I gave that are just sort of short of tourism and not quite these family ties, I think those are the ones where at least people people exchange is a component of it. Um, and what these do, as I said, these sort of form this web that ties the two countries together, but it's separate from the official government to government relationship, separate from the sort of commercial and economic relationship. Um, and I think of this, there are a couple defining characteristics. Um, one, as I said, that these, these people, people, they do undergird the relationship. And what they do is they, by doing that, they make the relationship sort of resilient. And part of that is that they create opportunities for interesting cooperation to pop up. And eventually that surfaces, say, the government, government level. Sometimes it doesn't even have to happen at that level, but it creates a sort of fertile ground for it. And on the other hand, it acts, these web relationships act as a um, shock absorber for the relationship. So when things go bad, there are people there who can kind of pull it back. Um, so what comes to mind, you know, is one example of this. Um, is, uh, there was a famous speaker of the house, Thomas Foley, uh, who she was smiling, as we do. We both knew him very well. And he came out of the state of Washington, um, and when he was a freshman or, or second term member, he started participating in those Japan exchanges. He rose up to become speaker of the house in 1994 when Newt Gingrich came to power, he defeated and actually. Um, led a campaign in, in Tom Foley's district that had not been out. It was the first time in a century that city speaker had lost his seat. Um, but then he went on to become the ambassador under um, President Clinton to Japan and been a very critical figure in the relationship that passed away a few years ago. Um, but when he went into the 80s, into the 90s, and there were these types of trade tensions congressional members would say, you know, all these kind of provocative things. You had somebody like a Foley who had been in these legislative exchanges had built up these human connections. And he could reassure his, reassure his counterparts in the Japanese government, the Japanese diet. I know we have to say this for politics, but things will be okay. And vice versa, they could use him as a channel. So this is part of the, the power of these people in these exchanges. I'm sorry, probably going on a little bit too long here, but I was gonna, one thing I wanted to sort of back up and talk um, a little bit about the historical context, really for U.S.-Japan relations, or perhaps it's U.S.-Japan experts on U.S.-Japan relationship help define how Americans think about that relationship. And these tend to be people who came to the relationship through people-to-people -people exchange. And I think of the first wave of these experts were people who were missionaries or children of missionaries. And these were people who were very influential throughout the latter part of the 19th century to much of the 20th century. So people like the uh, famous Harvard scholar Edwin Reischauer and was, went on to become ambassador to Japan as well under Kennedy. Or scholars like Hugh Wharton and many of the, you know, if you go back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, most of the key scholars in Japan had some sort of missionary connection. Um, then you had a second wave, and these were people who tended to learn, Americans tended to learn about Japan, either through their wartime experience there in the occupation. Um, and there's the famous uh, Stanford um, political scientist, Yudhavirio Pascal Aquino was one. 
Donald Keene, perhaps the, the greatest translator of Japanese literature and certain documentation. But you had this whole generation came to Japan that way. Um, then you had a third wave, I would say, and these were people who, when Japan was kind of rising onto the scene and different aspects of Japanese society and culture and Zen Buddhism were becoming known, they tended to look to Japan as a model. And so in the 60s and 70s, they tended to go to Japan and learn about it. And again, another Harvard professor, Ezra Vogel, the author of Japan, is number one. Um, people at Columbia, Professor Jerry Curtis, I think was one of your mentors. Um, they came to it that way. And then the fourth wave of people, um, I think is really the Czech program. You know, from the late 80s, you know, up to now, we've had, what, 32,000 Americans have gone into Japan and come back. And I think if you look at Czech Annex, which is here in Washington, whether in the government think tanks, under the age of 55, I guess, a sizable portion, probably the majority, first got a taste of Japan through the Czech program. And so this kind of tells a bit of what the impact of this program is. Um, and with these types of or impact, more broadly as well, of what people, people exchange's impact is. Um, if you try to measure what the impact of people exchange is, I mean, we just run in circles forever. We know it does have um, a strong impact though, and I guess it's a bit more anecdotal and so I, I can just think of two examples of where we've seen um, people people exchange moving the needle on the Japan relationship. And I think it's first of all from the 1980s to the 1970s, you had this great flowering of people people exchanges within U.S. Japan relations. The Jet Program is just one example of that, um, but also foundations being created to support U.S. Japan relationship. I mean, which Sasakawa Foundation is one, um, and different companies investing in this, governments investing in this, I think all have benefited from that. Um, but if you look back, one sort of way to measure what that impact is, and I think it's included in public polling of the US Japan relationship. If you go back to 1993, um, and the Gallup poll did a survey that year, and they asked Americans, are you friendly towards Japan. And how many people do you think said they were friendly? It's 43%. You know, pretty low. I mean, that's not surprising. You trade wars, you're a lot of negative press, negative image there. But since then, you've had this great flower in people people exchanges. Gallup has continued doing this polling here, um, slightly changing the wording. But when they did last year, the number of people who said that they felt favorable towards Japan is 87 percent. Wow. And that's more than twice. That's the largest ranking for any country in the world that Americans feel favorable towards. And meanwhile, if you go to Japanese poll, you can see a similar uptick. It's, it's tended to be much more stable in the 70s, um, but very strong um, depth of feeling for the U.S. And when it seems very resilient, you know, you might have a you know, there wasn't much uh, Japanese um, public trust of President Bush, for example, and not much of Trump. Um, so you can see the ratings for the president go up and down, but the feeling towards the United States remains strong. I think that's because of the people people exchanges. Um, second, and again, apologies for going on too long, this is a bit more anecdotal. It's my experiences, and I think, like many of you, um, my organization was very active um, after the 2011 Great Japan earthquake. Um, and we helped channel funding, you know, donations to Japan. But one of the things that we tried things that we tried to do is to try to um, document what was happening. And so we went out and we did a survey of how Americans had donated to Japan. And the impetus for doing this were a number of articles in the Wall Street Journal that said Americans don't care about Japan, they're not donating. So we called up, um, in the end, about 1,300 organizations that we knew were working on collecting donations for Japan. And we tallied it up over four or five years and measured um, 
at a minimum, we, we certified that there were $746 billion, just three quarters of a billion dollars in US donations. You know, we didn't capture everything, but probably closer to a billion dollars in charitable donations coming from US people and US based organizations for Japan. We put this in a general context of um, giving in the US. This is actually the ranks fifth in all American charitable giving for disaster. Number one was um, Katrina, number two was 9 11. Third was the Indonesian tsunami. Fourth was the 80 to 20 temporary earthquake. And you look at those, are domestic disasters or else you're getting in, in very poor areas where you had you know, hundreds of thousands of people killed. Um, so you have that type of money mobilized for a Another advanced rich country is quite amazing. Um, what's more amazing, you dig down to it, and unlike many of those other disasters, it was the money was in a lot of these small donations. And it was channeled through many different organizations. So we tallied up, um, and we'll look at the numbers right here, but it was 136 American nonprofits raised at least $100,000, not themselves, the other donations they collected. You know how hard it is to raise hundred thousand um, dollars. And each of these, um, when we asked them who was doing it, it was almost invariably it was one person who had some connection with Japan, the Jet Program, etc. So that was really a testament to me about how these individual exchanges are acting. Um, I should shut up. No, that's great. You should keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? It seems like this one is working okay, right? Yeah. Um, excellent. Thank you. Um, I need to stop listening to Jim. I'm delighted to be here. And I want to thank Bahia and Joy and Eric for making it all possible and for all of you for coming out in the ice and the snow. Um, because you know it's it's not a big deal for people from Minnesota, but for us Washingtonians, this is a big storm. Um, I had two inches of snow. In Maryland. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for coming. And for those of you online, we're going to hopefully get your input as we get into the Q and A session. My job tonight is to talk a little bit about one of the hats that I wear, which is um, the vice chair of the U.S. panel on CULPON. It's an acronym that flies around everywhere. Not everybody kind of scratches their head about what does it mean. So um, we can go to the next slide. I have these lovely slides. Prepared by Pamela Fields, of well known by the way. Um, it's the US Japan Conference on Cultural and Educational Interchange. So it's a very big, that long word. Uh, basically, what we do is we advise the US government on how we can improve cultural and educational exchange between the United States and Japan. And most of us are academics. Um, we have an arts dialogue, uh, so we have an artist. We have representation from Congress, uh, one person from each side of the house. Um, we have representation from the Department of Education, the Department of State. So it's a really broad conversation. And our colleagues in Japan similarly have their own commission that brings together sort of experts and non-government people with government folks to try and think about what can we do to make sure that younger Americans and Japanese are still learning about each other's countries, still have the opportunity to get scholarship, to go abroad, and then once they do that, they have the opportunity to then translate that into some professional ambition of their own, right? So we are doing, right now, we do a number of working groups or task forces. We had one on educational exchange. Um, and just as I was coming on board, that was winding up. We have the arts dialogue, which is a terrific conversation to make sure that young curators of Japanese art here in the United States, but also curators of American art in Japan, continue to be taken care of and raised and given jobs so that we don't lose our arts. Um, our arts exchange is so important to many Americans' exposure to Japan is really through arts, right? They may not actually have an opportunity to go to the country, but they certainly know about woodblock prints or other kinds of things because we've got a very uh, vibrant arts exchange. And then the last task force is the one that I'm heading up here on the US side, which is on the next generation, which is you guys. Um, and this is you know, my opportunity to sort of ask you for information and also to tell you to keep, keep, keep your communication open with members of Polkon. We try our best, but we are not the next generation, as you can tell. 
Um, but we also want to make sure that we're in a position to advocate on your behalf, to help build bridges where you see a need, um, whether it's funding, whether it's just in your profession, for example, you may see a need. But what we want to do here is try to collaborate with our Japanese colleagues to find out you know, what it is that needs to happen so that the exchanges that we've had for young professionals continue to be vibrant, but also that we build the new ones that, are, that weren't imagined five to 10 or 15 years ago. I'm gonna talk about three initiatives that Kokon is doing. Um, one I'm not directly responsible uh, for, but it is Team Up, it's an educational exchange. And this is to help make sure that colleges and universities across the United States and across Japan can build programs together that will allow students to uh, study abroad. Now this may seem very mechanical or mechanistic, um, but the reality is a lot of young students don't have the opportunity to go study at a Japanese university unless that university will give them college credit, unless there are scholarship trans transfers, unless they can, can make sure that what they're doing in Japan will help them graduate when they come back to the United States. So these, this team up exercise is kind of an infrastructure building exercise and it was supported by the embassy. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy was very, very supportive of this and managed to fund it um, for four or five consecutive years. We teamed up in that effort to sort of identify colleges, uh, a diverse array of colleges, community colleges where students were getting associate degrees, four year colleges across all different regions of the United States. If you had an interest in developing a study abroad program with Japan on your campus, you come to us, we will help you uh, figure out a way to do that. We'll give you advice on designing a memorandum of understanding. We took people over, not me personally, but, but the Kokon folks took people over to Japan who were interested, and it's been really, really successful. Um, about 20% of the colleges and universities in Japan and the United States, right, have, that have been exposed to this program, in, in effect, we're well on the way to developing a memorandum of understanding and developing the infrastructure for students to go back and forth. So it's been really, really successful. We're very happy the State Department funded it. And the, the, the next slide is the is if you really are interested in this kind of thing, or if you know an educational organization that wants to get more information or be involved in this, um, next slide. Yeah. that's where you go. That website, right? Um, so this is the team up. It'll be it'll be on Kokon's website. Uh, it's also on the embassy, U.S. Embassy in Tokyo's website. Again, it's got State Department support. So the idea here is we had a need. Everybody thought that was an important thing. Students weren't coming to the United States from Japan, but it turns out that most of the hurdles were not because they didn't want to, because it was just too hard to do it. Um, a lot of young Japanese got very frightened at the idea of applying for a visa. So Ambassador Kennedy said, okay, let's, let's go talk to people who've actually studied abroad, Japanese. She had this whole video series developed by the embassy staff that then said almost all of the, uh, the leadership across various uh, groups in Japan, um, all kinds of people had studied abroad in the United States. So they helped on these videos to convince younger Japanese who were a little bit more reticent, especially after 9-11, coming to this country. And then the embassy also had to be schooled a little bit on making its visa application a little bit more accessible, right? Um, and so that was something that the ambassador felt very strongly about. So the State Department also rationalized the visa process. So again, the infrastructure of what allows and facilitates and makes it easy for students on both sides to go across to the other country and study, that's what we were working on on the team up. And I think it's been a, it's been a terrific, um, very dynamic program, lots of energy, lots of good concrete results that has it had a real impact on the numbers of Japanese, especially who come to this country. Um, the, second, um, the second and third initiative are part of our task force on the next generation, so let's introduce it real quick. Uh, coming soon to screens near you uh, is what we call Niche Bay Connect, and this is, seems like an obvious thing that should have existed a long time ago, but we were in our task force meeting in October last year in Tokyo, and in fact, it was the senior American embassy official who said, you know, I need a place to go. So when people come to me and say, what can I do to help young Japanese or young Americans, I know where to go to get information because everything is all over the board. So we went, ah, how can we do that? Sure we can. Let me tell you, it's been a real experience. I went with creating a web page, but basically we're also going to rely on you guys for help with this. What we're trying to do 
we may maintain several iterations to succeed. But what we're trying to do here is build a one stop shop. So if you are, you want to go to the next one? Oh, sorry, we'll go to the next one, then we'll come back. Our ambassador Kato. Um, if you are a JET program alumnus, right, and you are searching for an internship, and you can fill out all these little blanks, and you push the button, it will come up with the internship for you. <laughs> um, but basically what we're trying to do is make organizations who organize internships use this site. Also people for, eventually for a job site, people who have jobs available for people who've been on the JET program, who have Japanese language, maybe want to relocate back to Japan or vice versa. Um, so this is a connect site. We've got a lot of stakeholders. We're hoping this will be the place where you can go when you're deciding on that next phase of career development, whether it's getting a grant or a fellowship, going back to study in Japan, getting an internship, whatever it is, that people who have those opportunities will share that information with us so we can help students, jet returnees, people a little bit in their, in not necessarily study abroad phase, but in the next phase of their professional development, this is the site that we hope to be very useful for you guys. It'll take a lot of dynamic, feeding in of information and support. So really, we do depend on you guys to help us. Um, but we're looking forward to this. This should launch within the next month or so. Yay. And some of you guys came to a session we had about a, a month or so ago and pointed out all the flaws. And we were very grateful. I'm not sure we fixed all the flaws, but we certainly got rid of the most obvious ones. So I hope I hope it's useful for you guys. If you want to flip back to Ambassador Pablo for a second, we are going to the, the main purpose of this is really to disseminate information so that that first phase of the website is really the main purpose. But what we're hoping to do over time is feature people like Jim Gannon and others who have developed careers in the field of US Japan relations in a variety of different capacities to show younger people that career trajectories in the relationship can be very varied, but they can also uh, you know, be across many, many different aspects of the relationship. The U.S.-Japan relationship has changed so much from the time that I was a student or I was a young person wanting to get a job. Never would I have imagined that I'd be seeing the fellow for Japan studies at CFR. It just wasn't even zero on my radar. So I think a lot of this is to help, if not directly mentor people, but to show you the variety of people who are engaged in the relationship and the very, very different kinds of careers that you can develop right, in, the, in the partnership. So we're going to develop that part. We may also have uh, educators and others have chat rooms and other things like best practices. And we're going to, this is be a platform for people to actually speak to each other across professions. Um, okay, so go ahead a couple of slides. There we go. This is um, another little baby of the task force. Just becoming a, a living creature. Um, so one of the things we talked about in the task force is, you know, the next generation is very broad. A lot of people. A lot of things we could focus on. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about well, where can we make a difference and where can we start, right? The first thing we decided is we absolutely have to have Americans who can teach about Japan. So obviously one place we want to focus is the traditional area of making sure that Japan studies, Japan language, um, understanding Japan is still part of our college curriculums, right? So that's a lot of PhD uh, people who have gotten PhDs who are teaching in liberal arts colleges around the country, and also that they have resources. They get access to libraries, to digital researchers that, that, that allow them to teach. So that's one place. The second place was in emerging areas of collaboration. So we've been running a series of workshops um, on different areas of collaboration. We started off with energy and space. Uh, in just a few months ago, we had a workshop in December on biotech. and um, uh, cybersecurity, um, and we're going to have another one probably in Texas in June because we're having a symposium in Texas, maybe on IT and big data. There's just a lot going on down there, um, but a lot of the Japanese companies that are down there. But we're just going to have these workshops so specialists can come and tell us where we should be paying attention to the needs of these newer, um, newer areas of collaboration. And then the last one is to support traditional exchange organizations like JCIE that Jim works for and others that have made it possible for people to go back and forth, but also to use new technologies and new platforms in creative ways. So even for Americans and Japanese who don't actually speak each other's languages or don't have the time or the opportunity or even the interest of going and living in each other's countries for a year, right? But they want each other's experience and knowledge. 
They want to share ideas, right? They want to problem solve and see what the Japanese have done to fix a problem. So we teamed up with this organization called Apolitical. It's based out, if you can, if you could be a global platform based out of anywhere. Um, the personnel who run the Apolitical are in London and Berlin, uh, mostly London these days. But there are a group of young 30, 40 somethings who started this company. Many of them have been in public policy. Um, and they wanted a global conversation on the variety of issues that our societies deal with today. Things like aging or immigration, or um, we came up with a topic for the US and Japan that is kind of not what we normally think about when we think about US Japan, but it's rural resilience. How do our rural communities, well, how do we build resilience in our rural communities? Now, of course, the Japanese have been talking about rural revitalization for a very long time. And those of you who are JET, participants probably lived in some of those areas where rural revitalization was really a, a hot topic. And, and, and so in the United States, we have similar conversations. We just don't hear about them here in Washington as much. We may hear about them out in Minnesota or Wisconsin or Alabama. We may hear about them as agricultural problems or the opioid addiction problem or other kinds of hollowing out of the population, right? Um, but we don't have as much understanding about how our, our rural communities are talking about these problems. We're trying to think about resolving them. So this is our project. I'm going uh, with uh, Nihadega, Joe, from uh, JISPEC. We're going to go out to do a field study. We're taking the editor of A Political with us, who has no Japan background, zero. He's a great writer, really interesting policy thinker, has all kinds of European contacts on this issue of rural resilience, but Japan? Zero. So we're going to go out and we're going to go to um, Koyama City, talk about the compact city idea, which is, you know, for those of you who don't know Ishikawa Prefecture, it's very mountainous, lots of snow. We're going in February, by the way. I just want you to put that in there. I'm going to be wearing my boots again. Um, but we're going to go and see how they change infrastructure to make the community viable, especially an aging community. So we're going to explore this idea of the compact city. Then we're going to go to AKG. How many of you know where AKG is? Yay. Zen Buddhism. Um, so AKG, I did a homestay when I was first in Japan with a Sokoshu uh, Zen temple. And they took me to AKG. It's one of the most amazing memories I have. Um, that's why I need to go back. But the interesting thing about AKG is not only is it this gloriously beautiful temple in Fuku Prefecture, but it's teaming up with the Moni Company and Fuji Kanko. To build a Zen city, to open up Ehijimachi, which is a small, tiny little mountain town on the edge of this very historic temple, to creative for people who may not want to go to Ehiji and sit Zen, but who do want a vegetarian cuisine, who do want to think about mental health, who do want to meditate and think about it, um, their own personal um, growth and well being. So, this is a tourist, basically, it's a tourism initiative built around the identity of AKG as this historic temple town. So we're going to go there. We're so excited. Um, you can all come with us if you like. Um, but it is what we're trying to do is capture some of the ways in which some of these small rural areas in Japan are embracing new opportunities for growth and resilience as the world changes quickly around them, right? Um, and that's what we're going to be doing. If you are interested, you can go online at apolitical.com. You can look at our, the rural resilience. You'll see the U.S. Japan collaboration. Most of the stories are about the United States and Europe. There are some outside uh, uh, in Africa and other places, but they're mostly it's mostly a global conversation, and we're trying to get the Japanese experience into that global spotlight in addition to building a new conversation between the United States and Japan. So. If you give me the Venn diagram at the end, yep. forward. Yep, it's there. Oh, there it is. It's behind me. I can't see it. It's going to have a big head. Sorry. There's the Venn, there's the Venn diagram, which is one of the favorite slides of our, my colleagues at Copa. Um, but the point really is to show you that there's several organizations you should be aware of that are associated but separate, have separate identities. One, of course, is this advisory group that I'm a part of. Um, the other is the Japan US Friendship Commission, which funds new initiatives. Um, and so, if you have a new idea, the US Jet AA was a new idea at one point, it is now a vibrant organization. But if you have a new idea that you're building and you think it needs some funding and we can help you with some seed money, 
Absolutely. Um, talked about how she went through the whole process, but you know, draft a proposal, put it forward. We're looking for proposals from younger people who have ideas about building exchanges, building with colleagues in Japan, uh, a, a, a way of collaboration, be it policy oriented or be it just simply for the purpose of sharing ideas and exchange. So that's the other, the, the foundation part is the Japan US Friendship Commission. And then we have a scholar, a, a foundation for younger scholars. If you have younger brothers and sisters, friends who want to go study abroad, they need financial assistance. The Bridging Scholars Program uh, is a scholarship. It provides $5,000 for students to study abroad. So I have an 18 year old, <laughs> he's getting ready. He's dying to go to Japan to study physics or something else. Um, not politics, like his mom. Um, but that's what the bridging scholars are, scholarships are for. So if you have an opportunity or you know somebody who has an opportunity to study abroad in Japan and they need a little financial help, that's <coughs> please have them go on the website so that we can help them. The more the merrier, I say. Anyway, that's what we're doing in Hokkaido. You can talk about anything you'd like to talk about. Would you like to talk to me about stuff or should we just open up the floor? I'm a little cognizant of our time. So um, where are we, Bahia? Do we have time? I think we have a few minutes. Please, all of you online and in the room, please get your questions ready. So, Jim and I share, <coughs> excuse me, a mentor. And uh, Tadashi Yamamoto has, uh, has, has been gone now for six years. Six years. Oh my goodness. I'm so, so 2000. Yeah. Going on seven. Going on seven years. He was one of those people that changed the world in the US Japan relationship. And he, created the Japan Center for International Exchange, um, and where Jim grew up professionally, right? I mean, he created an entire center. He was one of the only people capable, I think, in Japan, given all the regulatory restrictions and everything else, of having a true people-to-people, -people, binational organization that would make sure the U.S.-Japan relationship and the people that Jim described knew each other and liked each other. But I met him when I was a young graduate student. And there he was saying, Sheila, come, come, come with us. So he put me on the bus with a bunch of local politicians from all over the United States, meeting local politicians from all over Japan. And I'm like scratching my head, like, what am I doing? He goes, you're contributing to U.S.-Japan relations. But he was basically remembering me in how important this kind of activity is and how important it is that people from all different walks of life in both of our countries and societies know each other. So tell me your Tadashi Yamamoto story. Oh, God. First I can't stop encounter. Kevin. You're going to make me cry. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. Don't make me cry. I know. He's just such an amazing figure. He's, and I didn't, my wife worked for him for years. Oh. And we met, she was worked in Japan when she married to a grad student. And I used to get a call, you know, why don't you, I had grad school hair down to here. And I was <laughs> not a terribly respectable guy. Um, I said, yeah, they're just like, my boss is coming to town. Why don't we go out? Because I uh, kind of knew the old guy, go out to dinner. He's yeah. probably a lot of time on his hands. Later on, I found out about the organization. He came more than one press, and I joined, and I looked at the itineraries he would have. And he would start out with three breakfast meetings <laughs> and then go throughout the day, you know, and then he'd have, you know, dinner, you know, rather lunch meeting with Henry Kissinger and go to meet David Rockefeller. I see at the end Susan Hubbard and Jim Danny. <laughs> uh, but it was part of, I think, what his thing was that he treated, whether it was the secretary, you know, opening the door for him or the CEO, he treated everybody the same. Um, and he was a really a missionary in a sense of people to people exchange. Um, and what he, he taught me a few lessons about it. Um, and he was operating, he was doing parliamentary exchanges and very high level commissions, um, but also trying to build up ties between the nonprofit sector and the country. Um, but one was that these exchanges have to be substantive. It's not just to say hello, waste people's time. People are going to, it's not interesting, people won't come back. Um, so you wanted to get interesting, vibrant people. I think that's why he was interested in, in you, to liven up the conversation and new perspectives. Um, I think the second was that exchanges have to be regular. It's not one off. You want to keep coming back, keep coming back year after year, and you build up ties. Um, and the third was that it's fiercely independent. I will never be controlled by a company. 
just you know most policies used in Japan are either under a company or they're controlled by the foreign ministry. So I will not let the foreign ministry I will work with them. I will take money from them. I'll never take a subsidy because they control me and I need it. And he realized that you needed to have the relationship between the two countries be strong. You had to have independent, neutral arbiters. He positioned JCIE as that. I think we think that it's natural in the U.S. context that you would think things play that role in Japan. It was very strange at the time. But I think that was the key that was involved. Okay, I mean, a question for you now, if I turn the table here. Um, and it uh, occurred, I mean, you've been working in this field a couple of years. Just a few. And when I first came in, it stuck in my mind, a foundation executive, um, leader of one of the top East Japan foundations, was complaining about funding policy projects. He said, yeah, same old, you can turn same all that. He said, what? Same all that. Is this, what does that mean? Same old white man around the table. <laughs> and even when we were in Washington in 2000, 2005, I think things you go, it was all that profile. And now you look at Japan scholars here, and I think it's they're at the top thing, it's probably more than 50% women. I mean, Absolutely. you're kind of the yeah. dean of that. Um, so I've nice. seen things change throughout. But what do you, when you're looking at this next generation of projects, how much are you thinking about diversity and bringing new people, new groups into the relationship? And how do you do that? So the next generation part, I mean, again, we are not prescribing who the next generation should be. What we want to do is have the broadest scope possible for thinking about what the next generation is. So the way I grew up, the way I learned about Japan, the way I developed my career is not going to be the way that probably any of you develop your careers, right? The world you're going to live in and work in and want to build, it's going to be your building of it, right? It's going to be very different than the world I lived through, right? So my job as I see it is to see who's there and what do you want to do and where do we want to look? So one of the things that we did and that, so that's why when I went through those three categories, one is very traditional. Japan studies. We want to make sure across the board, not just at the Ivy League, right, but in the liberal arts colleges or the community colleges, or if we need, if we can help get resources, materials to educators who are going to teach Americans about Japan, then that's what we want to do. So it's not just dedicated to the Japan centers or the, the, the places where you traditionally actually find a lot of resources and have people who get access. What we want to make sure is we build resources that are available for everybody. But the second is, you know, there's so many different fields today that fall under that umbrella of U.S. Japan. So let me tell a story from the first workshop. So energy, that seems pretty straightforward, right? Japanese are buying more LNG shale gas in the United States. Okay, so the relationship is changing, right? Um, all kinds of money, still trading companies, still pretty identifiable groups of people on the corporate side, right? They had some somebody from Mitsui come and talk. When he was talking about who they're hiring and the type of skill set they're looking was way different than what I would imagine, right? Very different. Um, but also, he's looking for Americans and Japanese to work together in Asia in building the energy infrastructure of the Asia Pacific. So it's not even a bilateral conversation anymore. You're talking about energy infrastructure from East Asia across to Central Asia. That skill set is very wide. Now, is that a traditional U.S. Japan skill set? No, we don't think about it that way. But it's interesting to see just the evolutionary um, expansion of what Americans and Japanese do together. Um, the other piece that I thought was fascinating, and this is a little bit um, showing my ignorance more than anything else, but there is a young guy who went the traditional route, uh, went to get a PhD, and was in Tokyo doing dissertation research, had a Japanese friend, an American guy, and had a Japanese buddy, and they decided after 2011, the triple disasters, that the Japanese technology, using new information technologies to measure household consumption of energy, ironically, the Japanese, it was just not there. So you had the two grid problem, right? You had the distribution of energy problem that all of you probably now know about, but, and all kinds of interests and ideas about conservation at the household level, like none of us know. Well, everybody knows everybody in Japan wants to conserve, right? Um, 
but the technology, IT, now today, the information technology available at your fingertips for consumers is so fundamentally different. So they started a startup, PhD student, Japanese scientist. They did a startup. That startup was so successful, Oracle bought it, and he's now the vice president of Oracle. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo, I know, everybody's eyes just lit up, right? <laughs> so, go ahead. I mean, this is a new world out there. I mean, the opportunities for doing something, the pathways to developing something, they're so different. And they're also so dynamic because the world we live in is dynamic, right? So, who am I called on to say this is the way you build a career? No, it's not. What we want to do is begin keep expanding these conversations about where opportunities are what kind of ideas, what's changing, what's new, go talk to this guy. This guy will be on our website but, and his partner. But but I think it's just an interesting time to reconceptualize what we think about as next generation. And it doesn't have to be, again, steeped in that very traditional sense that you become a Japan expert or a American expert or you end up in the government or even the corporate sector. There's just so much opportunity now to think differently about the partnership. Right. All right. Thank you both so much. It's yeah. time for Q&A. Yay, yay. And to find my blog, Eric, want to speak favor? Right. Yes, that one. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, I'm going to try this mic. This is, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great. All right. So we have some questions coming in from online. And um, also, we will take questions from people who are here in Washington, D.C. in the room. So for those of you online, I will go through your questions in the order that you've asked them online. And we'll alternate between online questions and in-room questions. So if anyone in the room has a question, please just raise your hand so that I know who has a question. And I will ask the question, and then I will call on you guys. And that's how we'll do this. All right, does anyone in the room have a question? Yes. OK, so it is just a microphone. Um, yeah, this works. First of all, thank you for being here. Um, second of all, I wanted to uh, thank you for this Zen community that I'm actually still thinking about because this is right up my alley and I'm obsessed with it. So there's that. And I wanted to ask you, is there an initiative, is there something that, you know, your program does and kind of uh, moves on into generations because you've worked with a lot of generations coming in that preserves the history and the authenticity of these um, Japanese communities that I'm sure that when they're historical in that way, they have so much value to them. And I know because I personally love historical cities and I love preserving that, but also not just in the infrastructure, but the people themselves and that how they connect with the American community. And if this is something that, you know, they enjoy and that it's, it's part of, you know, of that, what we're working on, like preserving that. That's sort of right yes. there. Yes. So, so I wish I could claim credit for the Zen City concept, but um, all kinds of people who make so much more money than I did came up with that idea. But in the end, it's a bridge between a very traditional Japanese practice of Zen Buddhism and tourism, right? Yeah. But it, it, it apparently it was it was derived largely from Northern California's example of farm culture, Napa Valley. The kind of lifestyle tourism people want to go, they want to have clean food, they want to know where their food is sourced, the sustainability, and of course, all that Northern California sunshine and beauty they want to preserve, right? So, this is a similar kind of idea behind the MHD Monte. And again, I haven't been there yet, and I'll come back and tell you guys about it when I come back. Very exciting. Uh, I expect it will be pricing tourism, to be quite sure. honest. <laughs> the sure. way it's being built. But it is this kind of sort of health consciousness, you know, sourcing of food. It's going to take advantage, as I understand it, of the Zen cuisine, which is, of course, right, uh, a vegan cuisine. So, um, but I think it's going to, I, I don't know much yet, but beyond right. that. And I, but I do think when you think about Japan and all the stories we're uncovering in this rural resilience project of you know, people, I keep saying, tell me about your rural area and what they're doing. And a lot of it is building on the history and yet making it accessible to a new generation. We're not necessarily wanting to go and be steeped in what happened in 1868 or right. 1622 or whatever, but they're going to translate that into more modern conveniences, a more modern experience for younger people. So the Japanese tourist industry is already moving that way. And a lot of this rebranding that's going on in rural communities is to take advantage of the 
historical architecture, old inns, old you know, old houses that have been abandoned, that kind of thing, but with a kind of modern take. Um, so there's a lot of that going on in Japan. I, I don't know that one place is more successful than another. This AAG story actually has quite a bit of investment behind it. Well, look at that. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, and I will report back. <laughs> okay, please. <laughs> in, in my last through the last through February in snow, I will report back. Okay. But no, but there's a lot going on in Japan that doesn't seem like it's very similar to the United States. But in fact, you can go to all kinds of rural communities uh, in the United States in places that you don't normally think you're going to think of in Japan, and they're facing some very similar kinds of problems, and they're trying to grapple with how do we bring back the historical significance of this place? How do we capitalize on this in today's market, but also in today's American society. So we've got a lot to learn, I think, from Jackie's experience, and we've got a lot to talk about on both sides, too. Thank you. Because I, I might jump in an anecdote about a program that we ran at JCI from 2007 to 2012. I was actually born in a very much worse blizzard than this one um, <laughs> when I was in Vermont with a graduate school classmate who was then creating a foundation um, with inside of Tiffany, you know, Tiffany Company, the jewel yeah, right. And she was there as they launching the Tiffany Foundation. She would kind of work together somehow and wanted to do something in Japan. And eventually what came out of this was to create um, something called the Tiffany Award. And they would give money to us on the US side here. And we'd run a contest in Japan um, of looking at typically nonprofit organizations, although it could be city organizations doing this in um, a local area that was helping to revitalize local culture and arts, um, and at the same time do that to revitalize the economy. Um, and the backdrop was that you have aging populations and cities hollowing out, um, towns and, and so on. You have um, all of these local traditions that are dying out, you know, ways of weaving cloth or ways of painting. Um, that, you know, the last people doing their 80s or 90s now. And so this was an attempt to, um, one, give them, uh, you know, recognize them, and then give them a grant to make it sustainable. So we gave each a $20,000 grant. We would do a nationwide contest for two organizations um, we were awarded to. Um, and uh, the thing that was, they actually were really most excited about was getting a Tiffany trophy. You know, Tiffany side business is actually making a Super Bowl trophy in the Stanley Cup. And so they made a special trophy for these small towns in Japan. This is, you know, we're connected to Tiffany in America. This is us. And what we found is we were at, by the end, we were getting over 100 applications a year. Um, and you had these, I mean, these extraordinary arts and cultures. And the one that, the first year, the one that won it, they were doing, um, they were in Shikoku, and it was a rotating theater. I think it was a Kabuki theater. And they had to, they were going to rebuild it. And to do that, they had to do the, um, what do you call it, the curtain in the back where you make it. It was a diorama. And so you guys, great, you made the curtains, you know, traditional Japanese fashion. First, they went out and they found some old vintage seeds of the type of cotton that was growing in that. Then they made it was a seven-year process to make this curtain. And so they went through that. And of course, it showed that it was a very Japanese um, way of doing this, and you know, very tied to the local areas, the local land there. But they created this amazing um, art form out of this. Um, so anyway, I was just impressed at the, the richness of the local areas there. Um, but I was also in retrospect, I mean, I think this is something that Jet participants since most of you've been out in these godforsaken rural areas here, you can be a real bridge. Because For these lovely rural areas. <laughs> <things. laughs> I'm yeah. a farm boy, so that's why I can say it. Um, but I think you've experienced that. You can be a bridge in the outside world. So for any of you Jets who've been out and about in the countryside, if you've got a rural resilience story, bring them on in. We're, we're looking for interesting stories and places. Wonderful. Um, thank you. I'm going to actually do two online questions since that was quite a long answer, and one of these questions should be very brief. Jim, uh, going back to your original introduction, um, we had a question from Jitani about if you could clarify what the 43% staff was regarding the Gallup poll and the 
uh, opinions about Japanese They surveyed Americans. Are you, do you have friendly feeling about Japan or unfriendly feeling? 43% were friendly, 1993. Then 2018, 87%. Thank you. And then this next question is for either of, of you. Um, this uh, is from Kazuo Kata, Director for Programs and Administration at Sasakawa USA. Um, she asks, what is your response to those who say we don't have enough Japan experts in the United States these days to foster U.S. Japan relations? <laughs> wrong. They are just wrong. No, I'm just kidding. There's a room full of them right here. Um, so I think there is this, uh, that, that comment, Kazuo, thank you for the question, but that comment tends to come from Japanese who see and um, maybe of a certain generation of Japanese, if I can just be delicate about that. But I think there's a lot of worry in Tokyo, right, that, and, and people actually will say this to me, they go, I don't have any of my greens and Sheila Smith's left. And I'm like, oh my God. There's so many more people <laughs> that they do so much better things than, than Mike and I. I have great love for Mike and respect for Mike. Don't get me wrong, but 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 I think there is a sense that in Washington we need people who know Japan, who have studied Japanese, who are committed to the relationship to help continue to advocate for the relationship. And I think that's absolutely true. But one of the things that Jim pointed out was the gender balance and the Japan experts in Washington. But the real story, I think, in addition to that is we've got more people at more think tanks in Washington than ever before. I mean, I came here 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, and my, it was Mike Green. I mean, for a long, long time, it was Mike Green. And Yuki Katsumi had just gotten the job at Stinson, I think. And I arrived. And then Maria Solis came at Brookings several years after that. And now there's just there's Japan experts across the board. Jim Schultz at Carnegie, right? So you've got a wide array of uh, expertise on Japan in the think tank community in DC far more. Then if you look up on the hill, right, you know, the Con Congressional Research Service is full of really dynamic, serious Asia expertise, right? Um, but across the board in the federal government, um, inside and out of government, you've got people who are um, really well well qualified experts on Japan. So for me, um, I, I don't think we have a shortage of Japan expertise. I think what's happening is again the relationship is getting more diffused in a sense, right? Um, it's not just about the alliance or the bilateral, right? It's gotten way more multilateralized in the sort of in context what the US and Japan do on climate change. Not a bad, bad example for the moment. Um, <laughs> what we used to do on climate change and what we can do in the Asia Pacific or what we can do in all kinds of other fields together is really, really critical. But given who I am and where I sit and what I work on at Colcon, of course we need more bridges, we need more supports, we need more conversations like this to make sure that the people who do have the expertise and are on their way to developing career expertise can continue to use that effectively in a close partnership. So, not an embarrassment of riches, but we've got quite a dynamic young field. Do we have any questions from people who are here tonight in the room? Any other questions? We put them all to sleep. Well, well, maybe on that, I just on, on Sheila's point here, I think, she, I think she's right. I mean, something's happened. The relationship has become more diffused and diverse. I mean, there's particularly the Japanese side, but on both sides, you want, there's this desire for sort of a Madoguchi or Pipe. You know, one three people that you go to get your message across, um, and it's important to sort of have those institutional channels. Um, but that's not the relationship we live in either. You've got a so it's, it's a different. You know, here's a little nugget of my exposure in the Japanese on the Japanese side, because we've been largely talking about the U.S. side. You know, I, I worked in a diet office. I was one of the early people that had a job in a diet member's office, and um, and at that time you would go down the diet. And there was no targets or no foreigners whatsoever. And I was a little bit of a ooh, look at that. <laughs> <Warner>. <laughs> in my guy's office. Oh, God. Um, but you know, I learned a lot and it was a great experience. And then, you know, 10 years later, anybody had a foreign diet, had a foreign staff person in their diet office, right? And it was generations of Americans and other non-Japanese who had that experience. 
But what I thought was really interesting by the early 2000s is you had Japanese diet members who were so cosmopolitan. Not only did they come study in this group like Hayashi Ishimasa, who worked on our hill, right, in Senator Roth's office, Senator Roth, right? Um, but you had people who studied in Israel and Brazil, right? I mean, you had diet members elected to office, public office in Japan, who had done study abroad all over the world, uh, spoke all kinds of different languages. And so the diffusion in the bilateral is partly because there's so many more different areas that we are engaged in. But there's also, I think in Japan, there's been a diffusion, maybe not away from the US-Japan relationship, but to other parts of the globe as well. But I think it's a great thing. You know, I think it's a strength that we have that kind of perspective. Okay, we actually have two more questions online, and I think we see one question in person too. Okay, um, so we will go ahead and take one more in person and then alternate. So kind of want to just dovetail what you guys were just saying. So when JET was created 30 plus years ago, the issue, big issue at the time, I remember it was, it was um, trade and trade deficits. And and so that kind of brought a, a maybe perhaps unwelcome spotlight in Japan. And I think President Reagan and Prime Minister Nakasone kind of brainstormed this and, and it became a thing. Uh, fast forward, and um, there was this concern about China eclipsing Japan. So, I guess I'm asking you guys to prognosticate next 30 years what's going to be the impetus uh, to kind of keep this relationship kind of at the forefront. Wow. Yeah, that's a question. I, I think it's, it's, right. I think it's the human connections. Um, just getting Sheila was talking about diet members. Um, but on the congressional side, too, you have, it's, it's a different approach towards Japan. So in two, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, the congressional members who focused on Japan were interested in two things, well, trade and trade, you know, and sometimes in security. Um, but it struck me in 2011, brought a delegation of six diet members over to Japan. It's only after they got there, there was four that actually lived in Japan. One was Nazi Hiro who had been born there, others had been stationed there. Um, and so even in the Congress, you have these, these human connections that have their sons or daughters on the JET program. And I think that's what's going to drive this continued, you know, this ability to do things together, cooperate, deal with common challenges. And that could be aging, that could be, you know, health issues, that could be IT. I think that's what's going to drive the relationship more. Is that, yeah. is that best? That was great. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, the, the, you can think in geostrategic terms, like who's the next rising power. You can, you can think, you know, I, when you start out, you're talking about, well, we were all focused on trade and deficit. But like you're saying, now we're right back to where we were in the 1980s. Because that's a little bit what we're talking about these days. Is, you know, so it depends a little bit. I think the relationship with the US and Japan kind of goes through these cycles. We are always going to be talking about our economic relationships because we have that kind of complementarity and we also have the competitive side of it, right? Um, but I think what I think is probably, I mean, I think all of the new dimensions of our world economy are going to affect strategic competition going forward. Um, and so I'll, I'll take a stab at geopolitical answer to that question. I, I think the question is whether or not we're able to manage China. I think how I don't think China is going to determine our future, but the U.S.-Japan relationship today is defined in terms of its ability to stabilize and manage the trans transition of the way of Asia Pacific, right, or the Indo-Pacific. Um, we could have a big fallout over the management of the future of that relationship. It's entirely conceivable, right? We could have, if you want to go to the dark side, we could have a much, much more combative relationship in which our alliance doesn't actually hold up all that well. That's the dark side. I don't like to go to the dark side, so let's bring it back to the light. Um, you could have investment in capabilities and the kinds of human resources and technologies that really continue to mobilize, right, and sustain our economic competitiveness globally, in which case we'll have a very catalytic kind of partnership with Japan. Um, 
the trajectories can go in all different directions. But I do think that one of the big challenges we have today and why we can't see forward that clearly is because we've always assumed that economic interdependence was a positive, right? And I think we don't have to demonize China, and my, my intention is not to do that. Um, but I think what we're beginning to see is perhaps people who believe differently, who also have economic power, who don't want the same kind of economic interdependence. And our economic well-being could depend on that significantly if that changes, right? So I think Japan and the United States are still on the same side on that equation. Whether others in the rest of the world are going to be 10, 20, 30 years from now, I'm not so sure. I mean, we've all, generations of us, have grown up in this kind of post war order. We've taken it for granted economic growth, economic interdependence, open competition for ideas and innovation is the new way of the future. And that has always been a very positive way for the future. We had trade conflicts, we had little things here and there, but we never questioned that premise. And we're starting to see the questioning of that premise. And again, I don't think we have to demonize any particular country, but if that premise gets turned on its head, then it will become very difficult to see ahead um, in the next two, three decades. I have an 18 year old, so I, I worry a little bit because all of us have just taken it for granted by right here. We've breathed it. And even at the worst part of the trade deck, the trade talks or the trade competition, we didn't question that basic premise. The future was our ability to work together, to innovate together, and yes, to compete um, in an open society, right? I'm sure we're headed that way. We, we could be, that could be a contested territory, I think, going forward. So are, you worried, are you worried specifically about the U.S. and Asia versus about the U.S. and Japan relationship? Like, I sour. think it's a big global question. I, think, I, I don't think the U.S. and Japan relationship is going to turn sour. Um, I think that we're going to be tested in different ways, and then that partnership will have to either adapt or you know, we'll have to figure out how that relationship can be more resilient, depending on what world we're going to be living in. So we're out of time, but Sorry. there are three really good questions I would like to get to on live. So I'm going to ask if you can respond to these questions in like two sentences so that we can get through them. <laughs> Try your best. Um, and then and then we'll we'll wrap up. So a question that just came in that I think is relevant to what you were just talking about is are there fewer Americans wanting to study Japan and Japanese now that China is ascending? No. Is that a factual? Is that correct? That, that's that what, that's you, the question. Are there fewer uh, Americans yeah. wanting to study Japan and Japanese now that China is ascending? I, empirically, I can't give you the numbers right here, but we can on the website if you want to go. Same number of Americans are going to Japan. The, the number is actually growing. It's not a big number. There are more people going to China, but it's not that the, because of China, less people are interested in Japan. So the Japan interest continues and is getting bigger, but the China factor, of course, looms over there. Excellent. And not zero sum. Good remedy. Um, a follow-up question from Kazuo Kato. Um, to what extent is Japanese language education important to help foster U.S.-Japan relations? I think the expert level is very important um, because there's only so much, if you're going to be an expert on Japan, there's only so much that you can understand operating on the English. Here's an interesting thing, too. I just want to put up the technology flag one more time. So I was in um, Nadi Airport. I was sitting next to this family. They were Chinese. They were trying to go downtown Tokyo. They didn't speak English. They didn't speak Japanese. And they whipped up their iPhone. <laughs> and I went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The bus is over here. <laughs> um, communication can, help, can, can function at all different levels in today's world, right? Um, so I think you don't have to be deeply steeped in traditional language learning to have a very positive or interactive relationship with colleagues in Japan, or vice versa, right? Um, I think if you're going to be somebody who wants to be an expert, or who wants to build a career living, raising a family, right, in Japan, in Japan then absolutely you're going to have to come to the bench, right? Both places. And I think same. Depends on what kind of life you want to live. Do you want a bicultural life? Yes, you need to. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, fantastic. And our final question. So this comes in from Paige Hyatt Streeter, the executive director of the Japan US Friendship Commission and chair of USJA Board of Directors. Um, she says, thank you, Joe and Sheila, for the excellent presentations. She's heading to Montgomery, Alabama, and thinking about countries out, sorry, communities outside of the Washington, D.C. area. What role can JET alumni and young professionals with an interest in Japan play in contributing to the U.S.-Japan dialogue or remain engaged in Japan? Well, first, you can join USJA. <laughs> <laughs> that was the answer she was looking for, I suspect. Um, so that you can be part of the national conversation. You won't feel all like your time in Japan is just wasted because you're sitting out in your, your community and you don't see how it matters anymore to the future of your life. So get involved. Come and talk to us. Um, but the second piece is, you know, the U.S.-Japan relationship today is is all over the United States, right? We're going to go down, Paige and I and um, others from Colton are going to go to Texas. Um, everybody's in Texas. <laughs> you know, the, the, the vibrant Japanese community, business community, educational community, civil society community, it, the U.S.-Japan relationship is alive and well in Texas. So let's put it that way. Um, and I think, you know, Jim was talking about the response to 2011. Japan American Society in Indianapolis raised pretty much a million dollars, a group like that. You go to Indianapolis, again, I'm not from Indiana. For those of you who might be, you know this already. I was astounded at the Japan presence and the Indianapolis, I mean, the whole Indiana Japan relationship. Um, so across the United States, there are these conferences, really intense activity in the US Japan partnership. And I think we just need to. To work to make sure to maintain communication with communities that don't have as much Japanese corporate presence or they don't have as much uh, interaction or they don't have a sister city relationship um, so that we can make sure that people can be part of the national conversation. We go to you, in other words. And I'd add to that, I mean, obviously join USJA. <laughs> also join the local Japan American Society. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting because you've got this fantastic recipe. Uh, Jet alumni and others who have firsthand experience in Japan, and maybe you know, out in Montgomery, Alabama, out anywhere in the middle of Kansas, uh, very rural areas. And you're able to communicate and able to bring people to connect the two cultures. If you've got people, so you've got the human resources there. Um, but what's challenging, you also need institutions, and that could be a Japan American Society. It could be having a secretary for a sister city exchange with the US JDA. Um, and while we're talking about this wonderfully rosy picture, the resources for those organizations, institutions, are becoming more and more constrained. So I think the trick is figuring out how to have these institutions able to, to operate on a continuous basis and have these regular exchanges to take advantage of the human resources that we have out there. So I just add that. Um, thank you, and I also would actually like to briefly add, it's not just about USJA, there are 19 local JET alumni chapters across the United States, so um, I really encourage all JET alumni to get involved with them. Many of them are partnering with their Japan American Society. They are doing live events, they are taking advantage of grants such as the one that USJA has in partnership with Sasaka Peace Foundation. In fact, Joy and I are going to Minnesota, Tomorrow, Friday, Minnesota, Friday, uh, where it's very cold, I hear, um, <laughs> to uh, to do an event um, where which is being planned by JEDA in Minnesota and uh, the Japan American Society of Minnesota, which focuses on uh, it's a grassroots forum for organiz Japan related organizations in Minnesota. And we're really excited to be a part of that. Um, we were just in New York for Jatani's program that was also a part of this grant, and in September we went to to work with JA Florida for a career development event that they have. And finally, our last one for this year, we will be going to Boston for an event on the cultural significance of the kimono. Um, so that's also being put on by the uh, JA New England in conjunction with the Japan American Society. So getting involved in your local JA chapter also is really important, but we do hope that you will sign up and become a member of USJA. All right, we're way out of time. I want to thank profusely Jim and Sheila for being here today and for everybody who came and braved the weather that
was not weather uh, <laughs> tonight here in Washington, D.C. Thank you all who tuned in on the live stream. Um, I am very interested in hearing your feedback. This is the first time we've ever done one of these, but we're really hoping that we will do these as a series in the future. Um, and so any input about how things went um, on the point of view of the virtual attending would be really helpful for us improving um, these. So feel free to email me at director at usja.org. All right, let's give a big round of applause. To <laughs>